Welcome. Uh, we'll go ahead and start now. Uh, welcome to the first uh, Nordic Society of Human Genetics and Precision Medicine webinar. Uh, I'm excited to say that there are 150 people in the audience, which was uh, beyond what I had expected. Um, uh, I'm going to just take a few minutes to uh, give you a, a sense of uh, what the society has been doing since our inaugural meeting in Reykjavik. Um, we've held several meetings uh, either on our own or together with other groups and we're planning other meetings for the future. Um, one particular uh, in 2021, we're planning a symposium, virtual symposium on COVID-19 research in the Nordic region. And uh, as, as all of you, I hope, have know the, the 2020 biennial meeting will happen in 2021. At the moment, because of the uncertainty uh, of the pandemic, the, the date will likely be uh, set for aug late August or September. The other thing that has been happening, um, not necessarily in, in, in a more public way, is that we've been engaging with different stakeholders in the Nordic region. Uh, most importantly, of course, the funders, uh, but also uh, political groups, Nordic Council of Ministers, and, and then also uh, ministerial and other uh, people at, in the at the national level. And more recently, the research universities in particular, we co-sponsored a meeting with the Nordic Health and Medical Deans on precision medicine. Um, and the third part of our activity has been uh, working on building an information structure for the membership and, and for other groups as well. Um, this webinar series, uh, we, I, I think we'll be able to get one in in December, uh, but definitely we'll be working on month, having monthly ones in the, the new year. The, the society has formed a legal working group that will be issuing position papers on topics that are relevant to harmonizing uh, research across the Nordic region. Uh, and has already issued a, a short memo about the, uh, the Schrems II decision and what that means for Nordic researchers working with researchers outside the EEA. Um, and it will be a, a paper uh, that will be uh, available publicly uh, once it's completed also and uh, submitted to a journal. Uh, our newsletter has been seasonal and uh, my intention is to have it be monthly as we move forward with research updates, uh, policy news. And we're pretty active on Twitter uh, and uh, we're just got started on LinkedIn and we have a YouTube channel um, which uh, is beginning to grow and uh, I invite you to submit any of your interesting lectures online to me and I can, um, we can feature them. Um, I just want to focus very briefly on the fact that we are trying to build up a really uh, strong, sorry, strong uh, news function to keep people in the loop about what's going on, both in terms of recent research and also on the, the political funding um, legal landscape in, in, Europe, in uh, the Nordic region, in Europe and beyond, of course. Um, so finally, I'll just uh, finish by mentioning that uh, these are the upcoming events and activities. Um, I'd be glad if we, uh, someone might uh, be interested in helping us work on our social media uh, and communication um, efforts. And so if there's a young uh, researcher out there who enjoys this and is a digital native, please contact me. And the same for the virtual journal club that we're going to be working uh, with beginning in the new year. And of course, uh, any topics for future webinars. We uh, really look forward to uh, hearing from everybody with their new data. So thanks for your attention. Don't forget to renew your membership. And that is as far as I will go. Um, I will now move into the webinar portion. Uh, me one second here. So. So our webinar will be given by, it's a pre-recorded talk by Kari Stephenson of Deco Genetics uh, and Kari, his research achievements and his impact on how big data biomedical research is conducted doesn't need an introduction to this group. But I should note that 
as the first president of the society, he's been instrumental and very supportive in helping to build these activities that we're, we've begun and are continuing to develop. So at that, this point, I believe I will turn it over to Nico who will uh, initiate the lecture. What I'm gonna talk about today is the way in which we at Decogenetics have been using study of human diversity in general to shed light on uh, pathogenesis of all kinds of diseases and all kinds of, of, uh, of other traits. And in doing so, we have been using genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics. And I think that probably over the past 15 to 20 years, there has been a paradigm shift away from the use of animal models that require but once you have done your study, you have to find the conversion coefficient to translate what you discover about the animal model over to Homo sapiens. But instead of doing that, eh, just because of the ability to, to replace the animal model approach with the study of human diversity has come with increasing computing power, increasing capacity to store large, large amounts of data, mine large amounts of data, and gather uh, uh, rather broad-based kinds of data on, on diversity in the sequence of the human genome, uh, on transcripts and on the proteome. But the basic idea is that if you, if you study in detail the human diversity, not just diversity in risk of disease and response to treatment, but the whole spectrum of human diversity, and if you put then data on diseases in the context of that, it will facilitate unprecedented ability to figure out how diseases come about, what constitute risks of diseases, and the probability of response to treatment. And this all began with, with human genetics. And actually, the transforming event in uh, the history of human genetics happened when we uh, developed the ability to scan the entire genome with genome associations. Before that, we were relying on linkage, which is a weak method, and we were relying on the use of candidate genes, where the approach was based on the assumption that you could predict what gene or what the series of genes or kind of genes had the variants that predispose to the disease. But once, you, once you, we had the ability to scan the entire genome, we lost the need of the hypothesis. And being free of the hypothesis, eh, it led to enormous, enormous burst in discoveries, led to avalanche of discoveries, basically transformed our ability to uh, figure out the correlations, way, the correlations between variants of the genome and variants in phenotype. And actually, if you, if you ask the question, how large percent or, you know, how large proportion of human diversity is, is accounted for by diversity in the sequences of A, C, Gs, and Ts in the human genome. And actually, the diversity in the sequences of A, C, Gs, and Ts accounts for extraordinarily large proportion of all diversity, not just human diversity, but the diversity in the biosphere in general. When you, when you, uh, when you want to look for correlations between variants in the sequence, and variants in the phenotypes, you need two data sets. You need a data set on diversity in the sequence, and you need a data set on diversity in phenotype. And once you have gathered those data sets, you begin to look for correlations between data points in the two data set. But you can equally well use the same kind of data mining algorithms to mine two data sets on separate kinds of phenotypes. And we indeed have done a lot of that, look for correlations between phenotypes and I will come back to that a little bit later. But in our search for variants in the genome that they associate with uh, all kinds of human phenotypes, we have basically found two sets of variants, the common variants that are common either because they have been under positive selection or they came with us out of Africa. And when it comes to risk of disease, each one of them confers a very small risk, but they are sufficiently common that you can have a confluence of these variants that confer very large genetic risk, even though they account for very little heritability. 
Uh, we have also uh, been somewhat successful in searching for rare variants that confer large risk of disease. I'm, I'm absolutely sure there are a lot of rare variants that confer very small risk of disease, but we are only able to find uh, ones with large effect today because we, we don't have the power to find uh, the rare variants with small effect. And keep in mind that the rare variant is, is either recent or new, or it's on the negative selection or both. Uh, the ability to, to approach the study of the genetics of a disease, approach the study of or the search for variants in the genome that associate with risk of disease in a hypothesis independent manner is trans has been transformative, as I said before. And let me give you one example of how the ability to search in a hypothesis independent manner has changed our fundamental view of a particular disease. And the disease in question is atrial fibrillation. Before we started our work, the assumption was always that most, if not all, of the cases of atrial fibrillation were caused by dysfunction in ion channels because the arrhythmia, irregular heart rhythm, irregular uh, electric activity in the heart, we assumed was due to the electric mechanism going, going stray. Uh, keep in mind that atrial fibrillation is the most common sustained cardiac arrhythmia of man, and co complications of, of uh, atrial fibrillation include heart failure and stroke. The preval prevalence, the lifetime prevalence, is probably more than 25%. And keep in mind the irregularity of, of, of atrial fibrillation includes that you, on, on the, on the electrocardiogram, you don't see the P waves, and there is, a, there is an irregular distance between the QRS complexes. Atrial fibrillation, as I said, is the most common cardiac arrhythmia of man. It can be chronic or it can be paroxysmal. It is the main cause of cardioembolic stroke. And what is more, our data indicate that we are underdiagnosing atrial fibrillation because we find associations between variants in the sequence that are associated with atrial fibrillation and large vessel stroke and some other uh, types of strokes that are probably incorrectly diagnosed. Most likely, they are all of them uh, cardioembolic strokes. Atrial fibrillation is an independent predictor of mortality. It is vastly underdiagnosed and it is difficult to treat directly. The first discovery we made in, in atrial fibrillation was when we discovered a relatively common variant uh, by the PITEX2 gene. And remember, the PITEX2 gene is, uh, makes a transcription factor that is critical for the early development of heart, very critical for the A. A, for, for the development of the sinoatrial node and is important for the, the asymmetric development of the heart. And actually, it's interesting, it was a variant that was found in 19% of people of European descent and conferred an odds ratio of 1.7, which is a very high risk for a common variant. But what is interesting is that it is found in 60% of Chinese and confers an odds ratio that is only 1.3, so it is one of the variants in the genome that draws a distinction, line of distinction, between people of, of uh, Chinese descent and people of European descent. Then we found a variant in the myosin heavy chain 16. It's a missense variant that is fairly rare, with allelic frequency of about 0.4%. And it confers an odds ratio of atrial fibrillation that is between 3 and 4. What is remarkable about this variant is that it is an, a gene that the encodes a, a component of the sarcomere, component of the contractile mechanism of the heart, has nothing to do with electrical activity, just like the PITEX2 is, a, tran, is a, a transcription factor that influences the structure of the heart, but not the electrical machinery in any way, form or shape. A third one we found is, the, is a variant in the myosin a light chain type 14 that's also relatively rare with a, a allelic frequency of about 0.6%. And in those who are homozygous for this rare variant, 
it invariably confers on them um, atrial fibrillation of early onset. Then it's a variant in the in the plaque gene. This has an allelic frequency of about 1.2 percent, and and the, the plaque gene makes the plant plectin, which is a very large cytoskeletal protein. The, the fourth one is the MISAP, the, the variant in the MISAP gene. It's a 1.1 percent missense variant. Remember, MISAP encodes an intercalated disc protein, important for structural integrity of the heart. And the last one I'm going to mention here today is the RPL3L gene that encodes a ribosomal protein, which is primarily ex expressed in skeletal muscle and heart. So basically, all of the variants that we have discovered that affect the risk of atrial fibrillation affect the structure of the heart in one way or another and have nothing to do with what we traditionally consider to be the electrical mechanism of the heart. So what has this taught us? The, you know, this, this odyssey into the nature, the genetic component of atrial fibrillation. Number one, that the variants in genes making structural component of the heart that predispose to a atrial fibrillation support the notion that atrial fibrillation may indeed be a subtle manifestation of an atrial cardiomyopathy. Furthermore, it supports the notion that the, the risk of uh, embolic stroke that accompanies atrial fibrillation may be due to atrial pathology that causes irregular heartbeat rather than the irregular heartbeat itself. And this may have an impact on the way in which you treat atrial fibrillation because people who undergo ablation procedure and stop having episodes of atrial fibrillation still have the, cardial, uh, the atrial pathology and therefore, it may be wise to keep them in anticoagulation without, even when they have no episodes of the atrial fibrillation itself. This is just an example of how this kind of a, a hypothesis independent prevents you from staying away from things that you think are unlikely, but our ability to predict the way in which the biology works has proven to be limited. So this is extremely important. But then think about it, what happens once you have found a variant in the genome uh, that associates the risk of a disease? How do you bridge the gap between the genome and the clinical phenotype? And there are various ways to do that. One of them is, for example, to look for variants in the genome that influence the expression of RNA. Vari variants that we call E2TL. And, and this variant may either influence the amount of, of the message or the splice, splicing of the primary transcript, etc. And, and then we go from there to looking at, at plasma proteins. So we, are, we have done an awful lot of, of looking for variants in the, in the genome that affect levels of proteins in plasma. And these variants can do it in various ways. One way is through the RNA, but, but most often these variants do it in some other mechanism, through some other mechanism influencing the metabolism of the proteins, etc. But we basically have been going from variants in the genome to the disease in question, from variants in the genome to RNA and from the RNA to the disease. And then we have also been going from, from variants in the genome to plasma proteins and from the plasma proteins to the disease in question. It, let's now for a minute, look at the sort of how we have been approaching the proteomics. And this is, this is important because, because um, it isn't some of the assumptions that we make when we are working on, on the genetics of disease are, are in a way self-evident, but even the self-evident assumptions may turn out to be correct. So, for example, when we find rare variants in the coding sequence of a gene, that affect the risk of a disease, we, it, it comes naturally to assume that this risk is mediated through the protein encoded by the gene. But that does not have to be so, and it probably is so e, e, less often than not. And let me give you one example of, of how this works, is that the APOE, the coating variants in APOE, and remember the APOE4 confers a large risk of, of Alzheimer's disease, that the coating variants in APOE influence the level of about 292 proteins in plasma. 
So assuming that the risk of these variants in the APOE is mediated through the protein is uh, questionable. And, and I can actually assure you that our data indicate that the, variant, the variants, coded sequence variants in, in APOE influence the risk of Alzheimer's disease through totally different proteins. So, so it's important when you are starting the prote proteomics, even downstream of sequence variants, to be able to do it in a hypothesis independent manner. And, and for the moment, we do not have a possibility of scanning all of the protein uh, simultaneously, but some, the somologic company has uh, put together a, 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 an assay that they call the SOMASCAN that can allow us currently to assay about 5,000 proteins simultaneously in the plasma of a very large number of people. And to do so, they use the soma mass, a, a sort of which are modified aptamers targeting about 5,000 protein, and they allow you to, to assess relative abund abundance of all of these proteins simultaneously. And it's interesting when you begin to look at 5,000 proteins in the plasma of a large number of people. And we have, currently we have a, a data on about 54,000 people with, five, with data on 5,000 proteins in plasma of about 54,000 people. And, and actually, when you look at the variants in the genome and ask the question, which one of these variants affect plasma levels of proteins, basically most of the pro level of most of the proteins in plasma are influenced by at least one sequence variant and, and uh, some of them by a fairly large number of sequence variants. <coughs> and if you look at the flip side of that, you know, how many level of how many proteins uh, do variants in the genome affect? And the largest number of variants affect the, the plasma level of only one protein, but there is a bunch of, of variants that affect the level of over 100 proteins. And this generates a complexity when you're trying to uh, figure out uh, which one of the proteins is responsible for a component of the phenotype that you're interested in. Here I'm giving you one example where the classic hemochromatosis uh, mutation, the C282, C282Y, uh, affects the level of seven proteins, six of these seven proteins, uh, uh, and uh, uh, are encoded by genes in the iron heme pathway, and the seventh one is one of the in one of the transferring receptor gene families. So in this instance, the levels, the proteins, the level of which are influenced by this variant, make biological sense uh, from the way in which we understand the disease hemochromatosis. But very often it isn't so, and actually when we take when we take the plasma levels in about 40,000 Icelanders that we have looked at, and we ask the question, do these proteins frequently or ever associate with risk of disease? And we have actually found 264,947 associations between levels of proteins and, and all kinds of diseases and other traits. But it is very important to recognize that once you find an association between the level of a protein and the risk of a disease, you have to realize that there are two possibilities. One of them is that the protein, the alteration in the protein level, participates in the pathogenesis of the disease. The other is that the change in the level of the protein is a consequence of the disease. And, and it, is, it is that way more often it is more often that you see the, the plasma level of proteins change as a consequence of the disease rather than the disease being a consequence of changes in the level of the protein. But let me give you one example of how we have used genomics, transcriptomics and proteomics to shed light on a disease. And the disease in question is autoimmune thyroiditis and we actually published a lovely little paper on it in Nature last year. And keep in mind that autoimmune thyroiditis is probably the most common autoimmune disease of man with prevalence of about 5%. And it is characterized by production of thyroid antibodies and lymphocytic infiltrations into the, into the thymus. 
into the side of it, I'm sorry. And, and, um, and uh, it has two subphenotypes, Graves' disease, which is hyperthyroidism, and Hashimoto thyroiditis, which is a hypothyroidism. And, and we did a large genome association looking for variants in the sequence of the human genome that associate with the risk of the disease. And uh, we basically had over 30,000 cases and over 700,000 controls. And we discovered 99 sequence variants that associate uh, with, um, with variants that associate with, um, with uh, autoimmune thyroiditis at a genome at significant level. The strongest signal uh, uh, converts an odds ratio of 1.46 with a p-value of 10 to the power of minus 24. And, and it is basically an intronic variant in the FLT3 gene. And, and uh, that, this FLT3 variant and uh, also associated with the uh, risk of other autoantibody positive autoimmune diseases. And, and uh, uh, by the way, it's interesting that somatic activating mutations in the FLT3 gene are found in acute myeloid leukemia. And, and, uh, and this variant that we discovered, the, the germline genetic variant, confers an odds ratio of autoimmune thyroiditis that is 1.9. We'll come back to that a little bit later. So the variant that uh, confers the largest risk of all of these 93 variants is a singleton. It has an, an, um, it has an allelic frequency of about 1.3% and it confers an odds ratio of about 1.5. It is interesting that it associates, for example, with autoantibody positive rheumatoid arthritis, but not antibody negative e e rheumatoid arthritis. Then what is the FLT3? The FLT3 is F FMS-related tyrosine kinase. It's a receptor tyrosine kinase. E e and it, e engagement of this receptor regulates differentiation, proliferation, and survival of hematopoietic lymphoid and myeloid progenitor cells, monocytes, and dendritic cells. And, and, um, uh, uh, and it works through the JAK-STAT pathway. Uh, uh, and, and the variant, for example, is associated with increased number or increased count of monocytes in blood. When we took this variant then, and we looked at it in our RNA seek data. We have RNA seek data on about 18,000 Icelanders. And we found that this variant, this intronic variant in the FLT3 gene, it generates a cryptic splice site that leads to incorporation of the intronic sequences into the, into the transcript, it leads to a stop coating, leads to a, a, a generation of a truncated protein uh, where the, the uh, tyrosine kinase domain is missing. So it is basically, by definition, a loss of function variant. How can it then lead to increased risk of acute myelogenous leukemia, which previously had been associated with somatic loss of function, somatic activating mutation in patients with acute myelogenous leukemia? The next thing we did to try to shed light on that was to look at the impact of the sequence variant on plasma levels of proteins. And it influences the level of a fairly large number of proteins. Most of them have some kind of a, a connection with the immune system, but at the top of that list is the lichen for FLT3. So here we have a loss of function mutation in a gene that makes the receptor. And, and, and it influences it fairly significantly, so about 30% of the transcript are dysfunctional. But the consequence of that is increased concentration of the lichen, which appears to function as a compensatory mechanism for the loss of the receptor. So a mutation, basically, if you look at, at how this, how, if you look at the summary of what I've been telling you about autoimmune thyroiditis, that we have found um, an intronic variant in the FLT3 gene that, uh, that leads to abnormal splicing that lead to truncation of the protein, but that leads to a compensatory increase in the concentration of the lichen. So the net outcome of it is, is akin to an activating mutation 
than rather than a loss of function mutation. So basically, in this little study, we have several examples of how a preconceived notion or how, how this would come out would have led us astray, but we were in a position to look at both the, the, the genomics, the, proteom the, the transcriptomics, and the proteomics in a hypothesis-independent manner, and therefore we were led, I believe, to the right conclusion by the biology itself. One of the things that, one of the things that the proteins give you an opportunity to do is to establish a prediction of something where you have a, 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 where you have a temporal component. When, you, when you're looking at risk of disease or the probability of anything based on variance in the sequence, you have to accept the fact that we walk around with the variance in our germline genome from conception to death. But when you look at levels of proteins and their relationship to an event, the protein concentration rise and the fall with a temporal relationship to an event. And one of the things we did, for example, was to take a bunch of proteins and, and ask the question whether we could, on the basis of the level of these proteins, predict how much life an individual has left. And it's not a bit Orwellian to uh, try to assume the power to predict what is left of life of anyone. But basically, we can show that on the basis of a relatively small number of proteins, we can find 5% of women, or 5% of people, if we combine the men and women between the ages of 60 and 80, who have about 90% probability of dying within the next five years, and another 5% that has virtually no probability of dying within the next five years. And what is more, we have taken this protein assay and we've shown that it correlates extremely well with all kinds of measure of human frailty. So the shorter life you are expected to have left, the worse you perform on the exercise tolerance test, the weaker is your hand grip, the smaller is your forced the FEV, and, and the worse you perform on text or cognitive function. So this is a this is an sort of this is an example of what you can begin to find when you're exploring when you, when you have a data set, very large data set on on all kinds of human phenotypes, and you have on the same people we have measurements of a large number of proteins, you can begin to look at or explore for all kinds of or peculiar associations that in the end can be meaningful because we basically have also preliminary data indicating that a particular medicines that people are given can have at least a subtle impact on the length of life that you're predicted to have. One of the things we have to face when we are working on um, on correlations, looking, trying to shed light on how diversity in the sequence generate human diversity, is that the genome is not static. It changes. The de novo mutations uh, generate a difference in the genome of, of uh, parents and children. So, so uh, mutations that take place when the parent is an embryo can be transmitted to the child, be found with the variant allelic frequency of 50% being found in all cells in the body of the child and not being found in the somatic tissue of the parents at all. So one of the things we have to account for when we are on one hand in our discovery research trying to find correlations between variants in the sequence and the risk of disease, we have to account for de novo mutations. And in particular, this is extremely important when we are working on clinical genetics using whole exome or whole genome sequencing to shed light, particularly on devastating diseases of childhood, we have to be focused on the, on the de novo mutations because they account for a very large percentage of serious illnesses in early childhood. And to do this, we have to sequence not only the child, but both of the parents. And, and we have actually been exploring this uh, for quite a few years, for about 10 years, we have been uh, diligently studying 
de novo mutations as well as recombinations and gene conversion, which is another, which are all two other two mechanisms whereby new uh, diversity can be created. But if you think about it, we are on average born with about 70 de novo mutations, 70 mutations that are not found in our parents. And actually, it is interesting. If you look at, we, we originally asked the question, you know, how large percentage of, uh, you know, we, we asked the question, where, what is it that has the biggest impact on the diversity in de novo mutation, the difference between individuals when it comes to de novo mutations they have? And we found out to our surprise that almost all of it, over 97%, of the diversity in de novo frequency of de novo mutation was explained by the age of the parent. 80% of the age-related increases are accounted for by the age of the father, only 20% of it by the age of the mother. And, and this is not trivial, because I can tell you that the child that is conceived by a 40-year-old father has twice the number of de novo mutations as a child that is, is conceived by a 20-year-old father. And what is more, the, the child that is conceived by a 40-year-old father has two to three times higher probability of developing autism or schizophrenia than the child that is conceived by a 20-year-old father. And in it, addition to that, all kinds of age-related cancer of childhood is, has a strong correlation with uh, with the age of the father at the conception of the child. So I think this is, this is important because when you think about it, at least I was, when I was in medical school, we were taught that the old mother was particularly dangerous to a child, but the only thing that goes with the old age of the mother are rare chromosomal disorders, whereas the age of the father is associated with all kinds of other illnesses, much more common and, and uh, some of them very devastating. But it is interesting when you begin to look into, when you begin to look into the de novo mutations, because remember, they take place in the parents when they are, are embryos. They do not take place in the child. So if you look at the de novo mutations, you know, depending on whether they come from the mother or the father, there are certain peaks in the, in the genome where de novo mutations coming from the mother equal in the frequency the, the number of mutations that come from the father. In particular regions, there are no such peaks e, e, coming from the paternal genome. And uh, so basically in these regions, we, we have a mu, mu, de novo mutational rate that is twice of the rest of the, rest of the genome. And actually, it turns, it turns out that these mutations are uh, mostly CG mutations, and they happen in the same regions where, where gene conversion are, are very common, where there is a high probability of double-stranded breaks. So what we seem to be looking at uh, are regions uh, where there is a high probability of, of um, double-stranded breaks, this is constitute about 10% of the genome. And actually, when you look at these regions where, you, where there is this high uh, rate of de novo mutations coming from the mother, in, there is a very high density of CG SNPs in these regions with minor, minor allelic frequencies of, of all kinds. So this, is, uh, this appears to be, have, have been happening for a very, very long period of time. And when we saw that, we went to the phylogenetic tree, and actually what we showed is that we can find similar regions in the chimpanzee and the gorilla, but not in the orangutan. So this, seems, this region seems to have become vulnerable to double-stranded break uh, since the separation of the orangutans from the other primates. Uh, uh, that is the question, what is the consequence of, of having regions where you have this high rate of de novo mutations, one conclusion would be that you would expect that whatever attribute is conferred on us by genes in these regions, they must evolve faster than attributes that are conferred on us from genes in other parts of the 
genome. We have found no evidence of that. We have been looking diligently, but we have failed in it. So one of the, but, but, it, but the genome uh, changes through other, uh, there are changes that happen in the genome for other reasons than to know mutations, recombinations, uh, and gene conversion, the, chain, the genome also changes because of selection. And one of the things, and, and one of the things that we have been we have been looking up at a little bit is to see how how uh, uh, variants in the genome that affect educa educational attainment how they have been changes, changing in the Icelandic population. Keep in mind that we have known for quite some time that people with a lot of education have more children than people with little education. This has been well established. There's nothing new in this. And, and, uh, but what we did is that we, we took a, a polygenic score for educational attainment. And we showed that people with, with high polygenic score for educational attainment, who nevertheless have little education, have fewer children than people with, with a low polygenic score for educational attainment. So it is a genetic attribute, a, what a, a, you know, to acquire education that seems to have impact on the education you acquire, not that the children, if you have them, prevent you from acquiring education. And when we saw this first, we assumed that we were seeing negative selection against intellect. We know that there is negative selection against educational attainment. That has been known for a long time. But, but since, it was, since it was negative selection uh, uh, of the, uh, the genetic attribute, and we have shown that the polygenic score for educational attainment has been decreasing in, in this time. We have, have documented it by looking at the variants in the genome. But there is more to it than this, because if you take polygenic score for intellect, Y2, and polygenic score for educational attainment, they always go together. If the polygenic score for one of them associates with something, the other associates with it in the same way, with one exception, and that is in schizophrenia. High polygenic score for educational attainment increases your risk of schizophrenia. High polygenic score for I2 or, or it, it protects you against schizophrenia. Uh, and and uh, actually, there is a negative selection against the uh, uh, polygenic score uh, for I2, but if you correct for educational attainment, it disappears. So there is a, there is a selection, negative selection, against a non-I2 component or non-I2 attribute that allows you to acquire education. There is a negative selection against an attribute that, uh, uh, that has nothing to do with I2 that allows you to acquire education. Number two, there is a, a sort of mating on the basis of educational attainment, meaning that people with similar education tend, tend to pair together or mate together. There is a subtle uh, assorted mating on the basis of I2, but if you correct for, for educational attainment that disappears. So if you, if, you, if you put all of that together, there is a negative selection against a, an attribute that has nothing to do with intellect, that allows you to acquire education, and it is sufficiently obvious that people mate on the basis of it, and we don't know what it is. Peculiar thing uh, uh, that we don't quite understand yet, but that is the nature of science. Uh, because science most often, at least in, in my hand, functions as the tree in the fairy tale. You cut off one branch and three branches grow out instead. So basically what we have, what have been telling you are a, a, a few little stories about the way in which we go from, from sequence of the genome to clinical phenotype, 
and how we go, uh, how we travel that distance through transcripts and proteins. And and I I insist that the the key to understanding of common diseases of man, as well as rare diseases of man, lies in data on human diversity. Lies in in uh, lies in the understanding you can fish out of of data on the phenome, the genome, the transcript term, and the proteome an ability to analyze all of them together. And thank you for your attention. While we wait for the virtual applause to die down and the panelists to make their way to the stage, I'll point you to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We'll go through questions after the panel discussion. Uh, please preface the question or comment with a panelist name if it's for a specific person. And um, I'll also mention that Kari's lecture will be available to members after the webinar. So that's another good reason to add to what I mentioned earlier, uh, along with the general good feeling you'll have from helping us uh, fuel this collaborative movement in the Nordic level by joining the society. Um, uh, are we all ready to go now, Nico? Absolutely, please. I will uh, start uh, by introducing the panelists uh, again, who don't need much introduction. Paul Franks of Lund University in Sweden, Mark Daly at the Institute for Molecular Medicine, FIM in Helsinki, Søren Brunak of the University of Copenhagen, and Ulla Andreasen of the University of Oslo. And I'll hand the mic over to Paul Franks first. So thanks, Kari. That was. Uh as always, a, a really uh, inspiring and interesting talk. On the topic of um, de novo mutations uh, and, and father's ages, um, is it the case, do you think, that uh, the environment plays a role in the extent to which a father's age uh, conveys um, these mutations? In, in other words, um, is, is it programmed or is it something that is influenced by the environment? It doesn't look like it is influenced much by the environment, because now you know the ninety-seven percent, a little bit over ninety-seven percent of the diversity in the rate of de novo mutations, is explained by the age of the parents. So when you look at the population in general, the environment doesn't seem to affect it all that much. And that, that also made me think of the uh, Nature of Nurture paper that you published in Science a few years ago. Um, I, I, I suppose that I was going to follow up with that question, but you're, you're, you're telling me that it's essentially a, um, not, <clears throat> not a... Um, uh, Actually, that, if, you, if you just look at that paper, that paper basically only demonstrated the way in which you can quantify the impact of the environment because it, that is basically a, a paper that describes the influence of the environment that we call father and mother has on, on uh, all kinds of phenotypes in the child. Thanks. Mark, would you like to go next? Sure, I guess, uh, I mean, I had, I was going to take us down uh, one path, but since, since Paul has started on the, on the de novo mutation question, um, I would ask Kari to, you presented the clearly and very well measured increase in risk in de novo mutations and, you know, suggested that, <clears throat> not say that this might explain some of the similar fold risk in increase of, of having offspring with autism or schizophrenia, but would you not, um, expect given the high heritability of both autism and schizophrenia and that actually much of that age increased risk comes from different mechanisms such as behavior and, and education and personality traits that lead one to mate later rather than earlier. Mm. You see there, this is a this is a uh, this is a good question but complicated and, and I can tell you that if you if you if you take uh, the age of the mother, we go from the father and back to the mother, and you ask the question, what impact does the age of the mother have on the fate of her children in general? And basically, the older your mother when you're born, the greater education you will have, 
the less is your risk of addictive disorders when you're grown up, the less is your BMI when you're grown up, and the less is your risk of, of uh, all kinds of cardiovascular disease. And basically what that tells us is that the answer to your question, because my guess is that the age of the father, the, the more mature the father is, the better it is for the child. My guess is that this tells us that the answer to your question must be yes. <laughs> I, I think it is <laughs> that, we, that I cannot escape that. But nevertheless, the increased number of, of the novel mutation is bound to have an impact on this risk. I didn't know that, which is unrelated. Is that OK? <laughs> so I, I wanted to uh, highlight first, I wanted to highlight for the audience just you know, what they what the you know, remarkably impressive tour through the history of human genetics, very much of which has, has emerged from the efforts at, at Decode, um, this was. And to you know, sort of reinforce, you know, particularly how, you know, to complete an example, the FLP3 um, work represented. And can, can I, since you mentioned that effectively, Mark, yes. I'll tell you, we have taken that work further and we have found, we have found a, a <clears throat> mutation in another gene that it increases the, the concentration of that protein. And, and, and uh, the variant in the gene affects the risk of autoimmune thyroiditis, and it also increases the level of this protein. But then when we take the level of that protein, that also associates the risk of type 1 diabetes and, uh, and rheumatoid arthritis. But the variant in the genome does not affect the risk of these diseases. So it is an example where, where a, there is an example where a mutation, a variant, that increases the level of the protein associates with one disease. So the protein definitely plays a role in the pathogenesis of the disease. But in two other diseases, the increase in the level of the protein is a consequence of the disease. Hmm. So I'm just pointing out to you that when you guys enter into proteomics on the top of genomics, be prepared for all kinds of complexity and occasional confusion. <laughs> I'm sure of it. So my question was going to be that, uh, are there other profiling technologies that you think can add constructively to this systematic approach um, in advance of, you know, diving in and doing the sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat of, of bespoke experimentation to... Sort of I, I think it is... Down? I think that um, the most productive effort is going to be in phenotyping, get more detailed phenotypes, under phenotyping the physiological function of the organs with the disease that you're looking at. Then, of course, it is very important to have, you know, the genomic data, the one that gives you opportunity to make causal inferences. The proteins are the temporal component to this, and the transcriptome is really valuable, valuable, but not to the same extent as the proteome, because almost all of the proteins in the body end up in the plasma, but the transcripts you have to take from individual organs, or like much more so. But then I think you also, we also have to begin to fill up with, with data on what people call metabolomics, to look at something else than the direct consequence of the genome like the lipids and carbohydrates and stuff like that. And, and, but basically, once you get into a position where you can begin to explore the data without a clear uh, ideas what the results may be, it opens up all kinds of opportunities. And I think that one of the important aspects of well-designed population approach is to gather your data independent of the questions that you might ask from them. There is a temptation to let the questions dictate how you gather the data. And, and it's of course an extreme, extremely privileged position to be in to be able to gather the data, it, it, you know, independent of the questions you might, might ask. 
I'll try to move through everyone at least once, and then we can get back uh, to more questions. Uh, Soren, would you like to take? Place? Yeah. So, Kauri, thank you very much um, for a great um, presentation, as, as usual here. So, I I come from a protein center uh, in Copenhagen, and and you already touched on it. But if we uh, or, or what you said was essentially that that um, a given protein could be a driver for a disease, it could also be a consequence, a sort of a, a passenger um, that would change its expression as a consequence of the disease. So if you look across the proteome in your data, uh, and, and I guess it's the answer is complicated because one protein can be a, a, a driver in one case and in another case a, a passenger, but, but how many driver disease driver proteins do you think we would have and and how would you look at, at, at this relationship between driver and passenger on the, on the protein side I think it is uh, if, if you take variants in the genome that affect the risk of disease I think it is very, very likely that overwhelming majority of them will uh, have an impact on the risk of the disease or the pathogenesis of the disease through an impact on a protein. It's very difficult for the variants in the genome to cause a disease and bypass the proteins. But I think that it's going to be, it's extremely complicated, particularly when you when you look at variants in the genome that affect the level of many proteins, you end up having a, a, a serious problem when you begin to use the sort of principal component analysis. You know how how much if if you if you if you begin to account for a very large number of principal components, you may actually weed out the thing that you really look want to look at. It becomes a very complicated analysis and you cannot do this systematically you know it's you when it comes to variants in the genome you can basically use the same methods on all variants when it comes to the proteome you cannot use the same approach in the analysis of every protein or the change in the level of all proteins it's, it becomes complicated but very exciting very interesting and actually i'll, I'll give you you know I, I forgot to include the example of PSA, prostatic specific antigen, because you know people have been complaining that PSA is in many ways both an insensitive and inaccurate measure of the risk of prostate cancer. But if you correct for the genetic control of expression of the protein, you can have dramatic impact on the value of PSA as a biomarker of prostate cancer. So you can, you can, by looking at the variant, there are a bunch of variants, there's particularly one variant in the PSA gene itself, where you can see a difference in concentration of PSA. You can see a variance that can be up to threefold. Those who have the genetic high expressors have about three to four times more than the genetic low expressors. So basically, you, if you're going to use it intelligently as a biomarker of disease, you have to control for the genetics of expression. So there are all kinds of, there, there are boundless opportunities once you can pair together data on diversity in the sequence and diversity in level of proteins. Yeah, thanks. And maybe it also comes down to what we actually call a disease and what we call a trait, right? So. Uh, yeah, we, diseases are traits, but they are only a subset of the, yeah, yeah. the set that we call traits. No, but thank, uh, thank you. Roland Dessin? Yeah, thank you. A great talk, Kauri. So I have a comment or a question related to the most important organ of the human body, the brain. So you, the, first, you mean uh, the organ that, was, that is so rarely found in Norway? <laughs> Yeah. No, it was not so, funny. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, so we escaped, you know, went to Iceland. So, uh, uh, no, no, the protein assays. Uh, have you, what are your thoughts about this to study brain diseases? You mentioned something about the APOE. Could you, could you comment a bit more? 
I, 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 the, the data set that I am looking so much forward to get my hands on is data set on, on level of proteins in CSF paired the level of proteins in plasma plus the, the genetics. And, and uh, you know, basically we know a little bit about the correlation between levels of proteins in CSF and, and plasma. And, and that we owe to a, an extraordinarily good Norwegian neurologist who was working with MS and was looking at the, the correlation coefficient between proteins in, in plasma versus, or blood versus in CSF. But I think that we will have a, an extraordinary opportunity to, um, to make discoveries on the, on the, on the basis of or, or when it comes to diseases of the brain by looking at CSF. But we have some relatively interesting data on correlation between uh, proteins in plasma and C CNS diseases, but not the ones that I think are most interesting like schizophrenia and autism, but more the neurodegenerative diseases. Yeah. But, so, you know, just one more comment that also you alluded on to this, uh, the pleiotropy or the overlap between, you know, uh, cognitive abilities and diseases like schizophrenia and and but you didn't say anything about the immune system and the brain disorder and there are uh, well you have been discovering several of these links so do, can you say something about the potential I, I am, here? I am very I'm very skeptical of the link between the immune system and and psychiatric diseases at least because of complete, you know, because I'm, I'm an old neuropathologist and I have sliced significant number of brains. And, and uh, in spite of, of a lot of attempts to demonstrate inflammation in brain from schizophrenics or evidence of prior inflammation, there is very little there to support it. Very little. So I'm, I am a skeptic when it comes to uh, you know, the immune system plays a role in, in multiple sclerosis and many other diseases, but I am I'm fairly skeptical of, of the role of, of a, the immune system in, in diseases like autism and schizophrenia. But I want to emphasize that when I have formed a priori opinions on the nature of disease, I have invariably been wrong. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I will remind uh, the, the greater audience uh, that uh, they can submit questions down below that we can uh, read uh, a little bit later, but I'll throw it back out to the uh, panel here since it sounds like there's plenty of discussion in the panel as well. So, so Kari, can I follow up um, since, since I've had a few minutes to think about your response? So, so what is age then? Isn't that just an accumulation of exposures? Uh, and if it isn't, what is driving the de novo mutations with age? I, I, I like the way in which you're thinking about this because age is definitely, among other things, it's accumulation of exposure. But we also know that it's an accumulation of mitosis or spermatogonia. And we know that division of cells is the one of the things that uh, generates mutations. So even though I'm open to the possibility that added on the top of the replication arrows, there are some other things, but uh, and particularly, listen to me, particularly when it comes to the mother, because even though there, there, there is only 20% of the genome mutations come from the mother, we have yet to figure out exactly why there is an increase with the increased age of the mother. So I, I am, I'm gonna say yes, Paul, I believe it is possible, certainly possible, that the accumulation of, of environmental effects leads to some of these mutations. Thanks for humoring that point. Um, I wanted to ask a more general point too, because I suspect there's, there will be people in the audience who are very interested in precision medicine and as is our society. I was wondering if you could um, share your views on the translation of human genetic discoveries um, in, in the context of precision medicine uh, over the next years, how, how you see that unfolding? I, I, I don't think that, I think that what we should do is to look at, look at precision medicine in the context of, of a, 
studies of human diversity in general. The subject to human genetics is human diversity, but added on the top of that are other means of, of uh, shedding light on human diversity. And what precision medicine is all about is to put the delivery of healthcare in the context of our understanding of our differences. So you're putting the, the disease in the context, not just of, of, you're not just looking at the healthcare in the context of diseases, but in the matching of, of a, a person's a genetic background in the, and, and other things in the person's nature and, and the disease, so you're matching a disease in an individual. And, and it is so inevitable, it is so self-evident that we have to do it and we must do it. And, and I think that precision medicine will, or what we call today precision medicine, will be medicine, the totality of medicine, as we will look uh, in, in the future. But uh, what we are trying to do, what the field is trying to do now, is to push the healthcare system for adopting this relatively quickly. And, and our ability to do that is going to depend heavily on the way in which the societies provide us with access to data on human diversity so we can study it. Thanks. Any other questions from the panelists? I have a question. Uh, Always have questions for Kauri if we want. <laughs> okay, go ahead, go ahead. But I mean, the audience, does the audience have any questions? I guess not. At this moment. Uh, but they're very quiet, so you go ahead. So, so okay, great. I mean, uh, so Kauri, you made a great point about um, there being challenges in anything other than sort of inherited DNA to a certain extent in ascribing what is a cause and what is an effect. Um, and I well remember when you know the, the first expression of race came out quite a long time ago, and there were many of my colleagues in cancer who thought that all questions would be answered when we could see what what was you know expressed up and down and so forth. And they quickly learned that it was more effective as a readout rather than teaching anything much about causation. But my question pertains to with the the huge amount of of sequencing that you've done at Decode. Um, there has been a lot of, I think, somewhat confused claims about the role of somatic mutation in various diseases of aging. And do you have you know, thoughts or observations on, on that particular topic? Because I think a lot of what's been in the literature is quite unclear on this question or avoids the question of, of addressing cause versus effect. There, there is, um, there's a lot of data, there are a lot of claims out there uh, when it comes to somatic mutations where people have been doing studies without having sufficient amount of control data to go by. So when you begin to look at somatic mutation, when you begin to look at mutations that are rare, you need a very, very substantial amount of, of control data to be able to sort the, the artifacts from the real stuff and, and all of that. And, and you know, we, we have, where we have been focusing on, on uh, somatic mutations has has mostly been in the context of cloma, clonal hematopoiesis, all right, where, where, uh, where it looks like he, uh, a component of aging, possibly the cause of aging, is decrease in, in uh, stem cell diversity, where you end up having uh, the cells in blood being, or, or the population of cells in blood being taken over by a single or a limited number of clones, and and but the and and of course we have been doing a little bit of cancer somatic sequencing, and and I you know I would be surprised if you think about it that that we we have on average about 70, 75 de novo mutations in, in our genomes and most of them rooted in 
replication errors from the proliferation of spermatogonia. And if you think about the development, all right, if you think about the development and you think about the brain, if you, if you take a neonatal brain, it takes a section from neonatal brain and you stain it with hemotoxin and eosin, it stains blue because this is packed with nuclei. And you can just imagine yourself the number of, of cell divisions that has gone into forming the brain. And, and it is almost, it, you would have to postulate some sort of a new law of nature to postulate that you would not find somatic mutations in every single brain when you begin to sequence. So I think that I would go fairly carefully about uh, attributing pathogenic effect to, to, um, to somatic mutations. And when people begin to do single cell sequencing from brain, all right? Uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, the reason you know, for you to find uh, a mutation, a somatic mutation in any tissue, when you're just doing regular sequencing, the, a clone with a mutation has to have expanded to the extent that you can pick it up. But there is another side to it, which is that for the clone to have an impact, it has to expand to the extent that it affects the biology. So the task of, of analyzing somatic mutations when it comes to looking at the cortex or whatever part of the brain, it's going to be the analysis is going to be complicated. But at the same time, when you take uh, the copy number variants that have been shown to associate with diseases of the brain, there are there are copy number variants that have been shown to the same copy number variant been shown to associate with risk of schizophrenia, autism, ADSD, and even epilepsy. And then the big question comes up, how, how do you account for pleiotropism like that? And one possibility is that you may be looking at the consequence of loss of heterozygosity in the rapidly proliferating cells that are forming the brain. And in one individual, that loss of heterozygosity happens in a precursor to one part of the brain and another person for another part of the brain. And that would be one mechanism whereby you could theoretically explain the pleiotrophism. But, but the bottom line in, in my mind is that we have to be extraordinarily careful in the way in which we ascribe significance of these somatic mutations. But I am convinced, having said that, I'm convinced that, that the somatic mutations play a role in the pathogenesis of more diseases than just cancer. I believe Ulle had a, his hand up at one point. Is that correct? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, as the president of the society, Kaudi, so if young people from the Nordic countries listening in here now, so what would be your advice? How can we really sort of stay, take the next step in the Nordic countries in, in um, human genetics to prepare for precision medicine? Are there any specific or priorities? I think that the... the Bottle, the biggest, the, the most significant bottleneck for all of us when it comes to uh, discovering uh, something about the nature of human disease today is access to material. And, and uh, I think that we have to figure out a way in which we can get access to clinical material in such a way that society in general feels at ease with it. And, and, and basically, I think that the arguments that we should be using, and, and I have made to all of you on the panel many times, is that we have to, exp we have to get society to, expect, uh, to accept the fact that when we go to a healthcare institution, when we go to a hospital, when we go to a physician, the probability that we will get any resolution of our problem, any help with our disease, lies in the fact that they, those who came before us allowed data on themselves to be used to make a discovery that was turned into a way to treat or prevent a disease. And therefore, it should be self-evident, should be implicit, it should be the duty of everyone who goes to the healthcare system to allow the data on themselves that are generated when they are receiving healthcare to be used 
to advance the healthcare system. And I think that we have to try to convince our societies that it should be that way. Because the, the most difficult aspect of all of this is, is to get permission to productively mine data on human diversity in such a way that can be used to make discoveries, to develop new methods to treat and prevent, et cetera. Kauri, do you have time for a final question from Søren? I have always a time for a question from the Kingdom of Denmark, always. Thank you very much. Um, but my, my question was along the same line uh, as uh, all. I mean, in the Nordic countries, uh, people often point at our homogeneity and, and high degree of similarity. And in precision medicine, we in some sense need um, diversity and we also need data so that we can get the diversity exposed. I mean, but in your view, should we downplay uh, this apparent um, advantage that people have pointed at with the homogeneity? Uh, because I guess it's, it's, it's maybe actually not really possibly true, but, but what is your view? Keep in mind that, um, that uh, prevalence of the common diseases of man are, are pre the prevalence is pretty much the same in the Nordic countries as in the rest of, of Europe, all right? And that means that the diversity uh, that has an impact on these diseases doesn't seem to be any less in, in, a, in a, our countries than in the rest of the world. And keep in mind, when we are talking about homogeneity, we are most often comparing one nation to another rather than talking about the diversity within these nations. Because I'm, I mean, I'm convinced that the diversity, is, for example, in, 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 um, in Denmark, Sweden, Norway, is no less than in most other countries in Europe. It may be a little bit less in Iceland because we are so tiny, but, but nevertheless, our principal advantage is not less of lack of diversity, but a founder effect, which is a little bit different. But, but I, think that, I think that we have in the Nordic countries, if we, have the, if we have the wisdom to turn our backs together, we are in a position to do an awful lot of things that are difficult elsewhere, not because we are less diverse or more homogeneous, but because we have a tradition of storing healthcare information in a different way. We have the healthcare registries. We have a single payer healthcare system. We, we, have, we, we have traditionally been eager to partici participate in biomedical research. And, and we have a track record to show for it. And, and I think that we can, if we, if we now, when, when this is, you know, what, what has been happening uh, over the past few years, it has become so obvious that you need a very large numbers to be able to fish out the observations that you're interested in. So we have, a, we have more reasons today than 10 years ago, 20 years ago to collaborate. And I think that in the Nordic countries, we have an opportunity to lead the world in, in this kind of biomedical research, simply if we have the wisdom of, of turning our backs together. And, and, and actually the people on this call, on this panel, we have, all of us collaborated on all kinds of things and, and uh, we will continue to do that. And I think that at least from my point of view, I have gotten more out of collaborating with this group than with, with an, any group elsewhere in the world. So I think that we have a tradition of, of collaborating. We have a reason to collaborate more. And we have a reason to believe that that collaboration would be extremely productive. Thanks. Great no, note to end on. Yes, I was going to say we have no reason to end, but uh, in Icelandic tradition, uh, I think we should uh, stay close to our times. And I want to say thank you to everyone for uh, attending and participating. Thank you. And have a good day. Likewise. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank good you. Evening.